Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Real Influencers Project. I'm your host, Craig Reynolds, and with me today is a young man that followed his dreams all the way from Great Britain to Southern California, became one of the most potent professionals out there, and is now in the European Hall of Fame for cycling. Is that what it is? Uh, British Cycling. The British Cycling Hall of Fame. And you didn't go back for the uh, the induction, did you? Nah, nah. <laughs> Was, you know, like, Holmes, thank you, man. This is awesome to have you here. You have been um, awfully dangerous on a bike for years. Um, you were always one of the guys on the gate that people had to pay attention to. Um, sneaky fast, always got great solid starts. Um, world champion, national champion. Um, you've, you've done it all, my friend, and you continue to do that post-career as well. And we'll get to that in, in just a minute. Um, but thanks for showing up today, man. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me, Craig. I'm really uh, excited to do it. been listening to uh, all the previous shows you've done. Super enjoyed the Daryl Young one. Just listened to that a couple of days ago. Love to. Uh, it's great to hear from those guys that maybe don't do too much social media and stuff, you know? So right. It's hard to get a hold of those dudes. Yeah, really intrigued with the bars and the, you know, the Daryl Young signature stuff with GMC. So super cool and uh, excited to be on. Because you, you run for GMC, right? Yeah, yeah, 1985, I rode for a, a bike shop JMC team. Um, yeah, when I was 13 years old. So anything, I've even got a JMC photo album where um, I would cut out any JMC riders in the American magazines and stick it in. So, and I know you're in there as well. So I'll have to get that Amazing. out so I can show you. I was cool. yeah, I do, I'd love to see that. That would be fantastic. Well, let's get, let's, let's go back. How did you get started into racing? And then when you got that bug, what was it? What was the influence for you to want to come to America? Um, I think like so many of us, so similar kind of age, you know, discovered BMX in the early 80s. Um, somebody at school had a magazine. Uh, we went to watch a local race. I think it was in 1981. And uh, that was it. You know, got a bike uh, for Christmas. And um, that was it. Hooked like everybody and uh, still doing it today. <laughs> It didn't take long for that hook to sink, did it? You're like no. in there and you're done. Like it's takes crazy. every life thinking about it all the time. Still, it's kind of scary. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's awesome to see you still out there riding. I, I love it. You still got the, the the brake on the left hand as well. Are you left handed, or is it just because all the motorcycles have different brakes on their? On no, their I, I I am left handed. Yeah. So previous to BMX, you know, my bikes before that all had uh, brakes on the left, and uh, yeah, I just kind of carried it through. You know. See, I'm left-handed as well, but everything was always right-handed. So I'm like, well, I guess I'll run it on the right side. So I'm probably in the wrong, but that's why I can't get on a motorcycle. I'm going to dump it first time I ride one. Yes, yes. It was scary <laughs> a handful of handful of front brake is never a good thing. No, not at all. So tell me about you. You did your whole amateur career and you finally realized, okay, if I'm going to do this as a career, you needed to come to the States, correct? Yeah, I never really thought about it too much. You know, I raced amateur, um, you know, was, was again, was reading about you and, and you guys in the magazines. I always followed everybody the same kind of age, you know, you and Todd Lyons, you know, that epic picture of you at the Christmas classic still <laughs> sits in my mind of you and Alan Foster. And um, so, yeah, did amateur, you know, started to get good. Took a couple of years. I was a little guy in my class, so I always had to work my way from behind and then started to maybe probably win nationals and national titles. Uh, mid 80s 85 86 i battled with a uh, neil wood as amateurs we, we we met up together at the age of 12 and raced each other for uh and battled for uh you know 12 13 14 15 and then as, uh, as soon as i turned 16 um turned super class in england which was the highest level at the time um and then carried on battling with you know same guys kind of came through as well neil wood um and then we met up with some of the older guys and um uh, yeah, so just kind of raced in England and Europe in super class, uh, late 80s, early 90s, and didn't really have too much of a desire to, to come to the US. I always felt that you guys were just, just way above us, you know, and um, I never really thought it was even possible. Um, and then about 1990, my sponsor at the time, MCS, which was run by uh, Garrett Dose, uh, the godfather of European BMX, uh, he right. took us all out to a, a two week trip to a, a bunch of us to, we went to uh, Florida, for a week and did some training and then we uh, went up to uh, Ohio for the Christmas Classic and that's where we got to uh, race for the first time at least for myself and experience it and then I felt um, right there and then my friend with Paul Roberts he came with me and uh, we just had I mean we still laugh about it now at the time you know when we would go to sleep at night in the hotel 
we would just sit up laughing. We just couldn't believe we've met all you guys. And it was just so exciting. It was just magical, you know? And then ever since that trip, that's when I was like, okay, I wanted, I wanted to come out. So went back to Europe for a couple of years. I slowly made my way to California for a couple of winters here and there, spent a couple of months here and there. Um, and still kind of fought with it, you know, during the early 90s, you know, I started to realize I could I could do good in the US and had some good results, but I was still kind of homesick. I still enjoyed my life in England. You know, we didn't have to race as much. I still had a social life, girlfriend um, and just doing regular things as well. And I think that was always a good balance living in Europe. You know, it wasn't too crazy BMX, but I think about 1996, um, I was already on GT and I, I won the Worlds in England. And that's where I decided I, I need to be in the US now and and you know, try and make some money and try and um, try and make a real go of it. So yeah, from the end of 96 onwards, that was the uh, full on double A US California, um, you know, nonstop professional, you know. Well, you had a great career. I mean, there's no question you are, like I said, you're always, always a threat, regardless of, of the day or regardless of how you may have felt in the motos, you were always one of the top guys to look at and be concerned with. Um, and you mentioned that you grew up coming through the pack racing and being people. Um, you're one of the dudes that if I was in front of you, I was like, all right, I got to make sure that I cover my lines. Otherwise he's going to pass me in the corner. He's going to, he, you're very smart on the bike. Like it was like an Alan Foster kind of a deal. Like yeah, well, I, again, very, I, very I, intelligent riding. Studied you guys. You know, we only got so much we could see of you guys from videos and stuff. And me and you still laugh and joke about it now. The 87 worlds in Orlando. I think I <laughs> yeah. wore that tape out at the time. We got the Irvine Murray world cup um we got the dvds from those two events and then uh the jag world championships we got that on tv so i recorded those and oh, just watched really? them over and over so i really gravitated to guys you know early richie anderson um you know mike king eric carter always guys that i felt the kind of same thing uh maybe not the strongest guys but uh could make could make good moves and, and come through the pack so i always kind of um always looked up to those guys and felt like you know um that was always a, a good um yeah I felt that's the way I kind of rode as well you know I was never the strongest guy I had to deal with so many meatheads strong guys you know Neil was always stronger than me and then Jamie Staff came into the picture and Dylan Clayton that's just the guys in England alone and then you can add in the Europeans Kristoff and Basta Beaver, Wilco, Grunendal the, the list goes on and then obviously you move into America and there's an, an, another 10 guys that are stronger than you down the first straight so I've always felt like trying to be a consistent rider uh, thirds and fourths I always felt was good, you know, especially in double A, you just need to be third and fourth all day and uh, all day. And uh, that could still end up being a good result um, if you kept it consistent. So I always try to, to base my career on, on just being good and consistent all year round and maybe just choose a couple um, events throughout the year that maybe I could really target, you know, I mean, I just never thought I could beat Christoph and, and Ali A and Purse regular, but I felt um, on certain weekends, certain dates, I could I could focus and have a good run, and I always felt that was the worlds was, was that for me, you know. Right. Well, it, it, worlds for sure. But you also didn't you double at the NBL Grands as well one year too. Yeah, you doubled in. Uh, it was my last race on GT uh, in 1999, yes. and always always loved Kentucky. I always loved the track, and uh, I think like I think you guys probably the same as well. We always enjoyed that event, and. And um, uh, the track always suited me. I enjoyed that start straight and always had great success there. So, yeah, that was definitely a big one for me. Dublin uh, won the AA main event and won the Cruiser uh, in 99. Yeah, so good good weekend for sure. Yeah, I heard, I think I was in Reno. I think that was with the year that they made me go to Reno instead because um, we were focused on ABA. And I was on Mongoose and I was like, whoa, Dale has had a great weekend. Holy moly. And yeah, I knew it was, it was your last race for them as well. So last what a way to go out. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I like to say, I, I rate that as one of the, the, the I really feel, you know, I'm really, uh, yeah, one of the highest um, things for me that I feel good about, you know, looking back on my career, uh, NBL Grand, you know. Well, you also became world champion as well, racing back at home too. Tell me what that experience was like, because obviously you were one of the favorites going in um, and you pulled it off. I, I've, I've heard that when people are on their home court, it's more pressure because you have that expectation um and you had the whole country on your side too becoming world yeah it was a, I, that had to be funny always enjoyed racing the worlds like i said i think more european background the worlds was always our thing i know it wasn't quite as important for the american riders until later down the road um so once when i found out the worlds was in england um which probably been about the end of 95 i just put everything into that year you know i was still living 
in England at the time with my parents. Um, I just did everything right. I went to bed early. I didn't drink alcohol for a whole year. Um, I just put everything into, you know, spent time at the track. The track was three, three or four hours away from my house, but it would go down at certain weekends, a group of us would, and, and, and do little training camps and stuff there. So I just put everything into that race. And then already knowing from traveling stuff, I knew it was going to be tough for the Americans, different gates to what you guys were used to. So I tried to think of all the little things, the advantages, which would, um, which would help me. And, and it just kind of all came into place. I think by the time we got into the race and I really felt the, you know, the competition was going to come a lot from the English guys, you know, Dylan Clayton was actually probably the fastest guy at that race, you know, and myself and Dylan had raced each other so many times. And that's where I felt I really had to put, use my head a lot going into that final. And, um, you know, I just, I just felt just everything fell into place. I was in a zone. Um, and yeah, and it, and it worked out and it just really, you know, kind of, you know, kickstarted my career, obviously then into the U S after that. So, um, yeah, it was, it was a dream to win it and, uh, to do it with, uh, with something special. And I, yeah, I was super stoked that, uh, it happened, you know, and you got to wear that white Jersey with the UCI stripes all over it for the year, which is yeah. amazing. I went from, you know, I was still, even though I was riding for GT at the time, I was still on a small deal, you know, the European deal here's, you know, three thousand, you know, three or $5,000 go race. I was still camping at racing and, you know, going to races and with van full of guys and sharing expenses and which was still great times, you know, some of the best times, but I feel once I won the worlds, I then went out to California and I went down to GT and they gave me a, a um, a, yeah, a legit contract. And then, at the same time, they made me, uh, and I think I was the first guy to do it, to have the rainbow uniforms in BMX racing. So they made me, I think it was 50, 50 sets of that gear. Um, and uh, we used a lot of it for bike shop giveaways and stuff. And, you know, we did a lot of, did a lot of traveling the following couple of years, um, went to some different countries and stuff for GT. And uh, we'd always give, you know, the dealerships and stuff, to, uh, a set of the uniform and stuff. And uh, so, so cool. yeah. Do you have any, do you have any left? Yeah, no, I definitely saved some. Good. Yeah, once in a while, um, you know, people were. I went to Australia and gave some stuff out over there, and went to South America. Um, so people, you know, would tag me in and stuff where they've got one of my jerseys and stuff. So pretty cool. But yeah, I still got a handful left. So super, super happy that I kept a few. You know, that's amazing. And you're right, though. It did. It took us a long time here in the states to realize what the World Championships were because it wasn't anything that was on our radar. We, you know, the world's in Orlando. To me, it was just another race. You know, I didn't even think twice about it looking back at it, you're like, oh man, I could have been world champion and saying you're world champion for the rest of your life. You know, um, when I see people with the world champion stripes on, I'm like, you need to take those off. Like, like local dudes on the road rides. I'm like, nah, like if it's a sticker on a bike, I'm like, you should take that sticker off. I would still go, you know, I, I didn't get to go to Orlando. I was, I was close to going that year in 87. And, uh, you know, I had to work a part-time job, uh, the previous year to have the money to go out. I couldn't quite you know, raise the money to go. So my dad says, you know, we just can't make it happen this year. Uh, but I still feel I'd trade one of my big deals to go to, to be there and to be on the gate with you guys. And, you know, we all see the wild man still loves to talk about it and stuff, but that, <laughs> that video. And I know I've told, you know, talked to you many times about your final, you were so close to winning, you know, I, oh, yeah. I, uh, it was, uh, yeah. Some, and again, I, I think you guys didn't realize, yeah, like I said, or what you said, it wasn't, um of a bigger deal for you guys but uh, i would have loved to have been there and just to race you guys and been there and and just be part of it even to be in the main event i think at that orlando worlds would have been something special so i think you still did great craig just doing that but damn it was pretty fun you know i had crashed on that jump two years prior in the exact same way it was like my technique was really bad on that jump like my I'd transition back and my front end would drift Instead of staying over the front of the bike, I would go back too fast. And I crashed the exact same way two years prior. And I crashed. I'm like, ah, oh, dude, you did it again. Just, it was a, it was a crash. Like I wasn't stressed. I wasn't wrenched up or anything. I just made a mistake. And I'm like, ah, oh, dude. Well, uh, legendary final to watch. Like say you, BJ, Steve Dillard. I think I can even yeah. announce those races if you really wanted me to. I've watched them so many times, you know. So, um, right. yeah, you guys, we idolize you guys. So uh, that was cool, you know. I've got a picture from the, from the first straight, um, me leading the first straight. I had like a bike. I, mm -hmm. I got a great start. I'm like, dude, yeah. you're killing it. And then you fell, but whatever it is what it is. So let's fast forward. You, and I've said this to you before, are like the keeper of the history of our sport at this point. You've gone through, you've retired from pro racing um, and you started a podcast. 
and you know everything, Dale, about everybody from the States to Europe to everything, and you've kept everybody relevant to a degree. Um, how did you get into the podcast? Because you started it early, and I'm, I love listening to your podcast. Like the one with Danny Nelson was wonderful because we hadn't heard from Danny in so long, and it was so cool to, to hear all of his background and, and how he came through as well. But you're so good at that. Like, you know so much, Dale, and I love it. And thank you for, <laughs> for the podcast. Um, but how did you get into it? Like, what was the, the influence behind that? I just, I think like so many of us, we just love to talk about BMX, you know? So, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, we did, we did a podcast before I even knew what it was called. It was over Skype and we'd get as many people in there. Thank God I deleted them all because it was, you know, it was, I think it was even before the first Olympics. So it was like probably 10 years ago. Um, I don't know who told me about it and how we did it, but we did it by Skype and uh, we did it for a while and then I stopped doing it. And, but I've always kind of done a couple of year and um, I just enjoy talking about BMX, you know, it, there's no other reason. And I love talking to, you know, to you guys, to my ear. It's still nice to speak to the young guys as well. Um, but I think it's cool to, um, you know, I was a big magazine guy, you know, so I think there's still, a lot of great stories still to be told. And I love what you're doing. And like I said, the Daryl Young stuff, I, I, I didn't know too much about Daryl Young, um, you know, Lenny Batiki and stuff. So um, yeah, I just, I, I enjoy doing them. And every, every podcast I do, it, it's with a friend and uh, Jason, you know, Richardson does quite a lot of them with me and uh, to do them with Danny and, and Todd Corbett and, you know, so many guys, it's just fun. Just love, love talking BMX and uh, hopefully we can get some more um, down the road, you know, look to try and, uh, um, I keep trying to text Neil Wood once in a while. He don't want to do one, but I'm hoping I'll get Neil at some point and, and hopefully you'll get him as well. And obviously uh, I'd love to get Gary. I've done a couple of little messages with Gary. I think it's just timing when he's down here in, in Southern California. And uh, I'd love to get Christoph as well, who again, who's who oh. said no, but I know at some point, you know, I'll, I'll get him, you know. So. He'll, he'll break down for sure. Yeah, definitely. He'll, yeah. He'll, he'll twist it. I've asked Neil a bunch of times. He's like, I got nothing to say. <laughs> I know, I know. Neil is so low key now, but um, yeah, same thing. He's, just out of it. he's, he's yeah. not having it. He's not even having it. I know. And Neil's got great sight. You know, I live with Neil. And, and again, we raced each other since we were 12. We've got some great stories. And um, I just think there's more, more of these stuff that need to be told, you know? So um, I think eventually, like you said, yeah, they'll break down and we'll get them. I hope so. I, I hope so. The first time I met Neil was at Evansville, Indiana. And we're coming through the first time I ever said anything to Neil. Like I had seen him at the track and I, I, and I was like, okay, cool. We're in double A moto. And you know, you jump that big step jump and then you go through the S, cor S turns and then you yeah. go downhill. Yes. Well, those S corners, you know, you would basically, you were single file because then you were mm -hmm. going so fast. And Neil, we go over the step jump and it's me and then Charles and then Neil. And I don't know, I was like in fourth or fifth. It was a moto. Neil goes all the way to the inside of the turn, slides <laughs> out, wrecks me and, and Charles. <laughs> I'm like, what the? So I stood up and I looked at Neil and I go, dude, that was stupid. And then Charles <laughs> goes, yeah, man, that was stupid. You know what Neil said? Whatever's best for me. <laughs> yeah, I, think, I, went, I was like, you're actually, you're right, dude. All right. Well, yeah. all right, well I think Neil is one of the, the reasons I, I, I would say, I wouldn't say I was super aggressive, but I was, I learned to hold my own. And that was from racing Neil at a young age. He was tough, you know, and, and we, we battled, he was aggressive. He was bigger than me, but I think it was great foundation for me, me to, to meet him I'm up, up with Neil at a young age, because yeah, I think he definitely, by the time, like say you get to America, there's a lot of that stuff going on, you know, and I think I was kind of ready for it from the, the history yeah. I'd already had with Neil, you know, very big, strong dude, you know. Uh, he was big, that's for sure. No question. Great guy. Love the dude. And I think that's one of my favorite BMX stories to tell is the first thing he said to me was whatever's best for me. <laughs> yeah, it yeah, took yeah. me a second to go, man, he's so right. But dang it. Right. True. Uh, so true. Yeah. Yes. Mm. All right. So we got the podcast down. What's the name of the podcast? It is called, uh, we kind of change it, you know, it's, it's very ruggedy, you know, I do it on my phone, uh, there's no podcasting equipment or nothing, I get the files, uh, ship it over to my friend Lewis, who will put it on the website, I think at the moment it's called BMX Weekly, it's basically it's just where I, a lot of people from our era are on, on, you know, Instagram and, uh, and too technical, uh, so I just like to put it on the website and then I tell everybody, you can always, always, where do we find it, where do we find it, so I just like, it's on bmxweekly.com, so um so i put all the links on there and uh yeah so that's kind of where, where did you, you archive all of the old ones there as well 
I've all, I'll you get come really good the last, Yeah, the last two or three years worth for sure. Like I so said, those very first years I did, I deleted all those. It was terrible um, and just too much bad stuff said and that. So um, from where at least I thought it was somewhat professional or where it could be, I, I, our kids could listen to it. Um, I've archived them, yeah. So uh, they're on uh, Apple um, and uh, yeah, BMX Weekly. You can get all the links from okay, there. Cool. Or, com, yeah. So you've uh, also not only preserved the history of BMX, you've also started to build a foundation for the future as well. And which I think is, really, which is one of the reasons I really want to chat with you today, because I think this is great um, with your BMX Pro for a week. Um, tell me a little bit about that and how that come about, because this is great. It's such a good idea. Yeah. I think well, wait, first you did something before this, wasn't it? Um, right. Like to a fitness kind of thing. Yeah, I was doing that. Uh, was doing two things really. So, uh, I mean, after my career, I, uh, I'll go through it real quick. I went on to towards the end of my double A career, and then I kind of started to ride for free agents, and then that turned into team manager. We started mm -hmm. to do clinics and camps and stuff with the free agent stuff. Um, and then when free agent came to an end, which I think was the end of 2013, um, we'd already kind of done a clinic tour with, with Mary Strongbergs and, and Kyle Bennett, Christian Besserin. Um, so I just kind of decided to set up my own, my own program, you know, got my own sponsors, um, and so for that first year, I sponsored Anthony Dean was my pro. Uh, Christian Besserin was already based in Vet Pro then. Um, and then an amateur kid called Bryce Betts. And on top of the race team, uh, we had we started up a, a camp team through the YMCA, which was BMX Pro for a week. Um, and then we did a school program as well, which we just we've always done. We just obviously with the COVID stuff, we're about to put the school stuff on hold for the last year and a half. Uh, so the school program is called Ride to End Obesity. Um, and there's a website for that as well. And then BMX Pro for a week, which is our um, weekly summer camp. Originally, I was doing it through the YMCA's. My wife has um, a good connection through the uh, YMCA's of San Diego. And uh, we kind of pitched them on, um, you know, they do surf camps, gymnastics camps and stuff. Um, and at the time, my wife was doing, um, they have horses and a horse ranch. So they was doing horse camps up there as well. Uh, so we pitched the YMCA on... Um, getting the kids out to the BMX track. We'll kind of meet them there with bikes, helmets and stuff, and then spend a week with me. Um, and then it kind of grew from there, you know, through the YMCA was doing about 10 weeks of camp during the summer. Um, and then last week, last year with the COVID, um, the YMCA's couldn't put the camps on. So we just decided to do it ourselves. So I partnered up with San Diego BMX, Tyler Brown, and uh, we had a successful um, camp season last year. We did a Christmas camp, a fall camp, uh, and we've just opened up signups for this year's camp and they're already filling up pretty quick already. So it's been great. You know, it's uh, very basic, very grassroots. Um, you know, the kids that we find, um, we just, it's just the 101, the basics. Um, you know, we treat them, uh, teach them about bike safety, how to go around the track, all the basic stuff. And then for the ones that want to continue, then I kind of pass them on to Tyler Brown that then obviously goes on to, uh, he's doing weekly or nightly, you know, uh, clinics and sessions and 101 stuff. Um, and a lot of these kids are already racing. So it's been great. Been doing it seven years. It continues to grow. Um, it's a lot of fun. Um, getting a lot of sponsors on board now. And at the same time, I'm riding all week with the kids as well, you know. So that's why I'm still kind of riding the 20 inch because I enjoy doing it. And uh, I get to ride with the campers and um, yeah, have fun at the same time. So it's a win win for everybody. And what if, or have you guys ever thought about branching out and having, you know, an East Coast one or maybe one in? you know, Pacific Northwest or, or something like that. Someone would be interested in wanting to do that with you. Um, would that be something you guys would be interested in doing? We have thought about that over the years, but there's so much in us, again, especially now with all the bikes and everyone going crazy on buying bikes and stuff. There's so much already in San Diego alone. And that's, you know, with Tyler still doing a lot of stuff and, and camps as well, but there's so many new kids coming through and our attention is, uh, I think is our biggest key. You know, I try and what I try and do differently with my camps is a lot of giveaways. I give bikes away, you know, the sponsors come to the table and um, I invest my own money as well. You know, I feel if you give a kid a hat and a t-shirt and, you know, big trophies on a Friday, we race on Friday uh, just for fun and uh, just giveaways from all my sponsors throughout the week, you know, and I think it's really helped and um, motivated the kids to come back and our attention has been great. So um, we've thought about, you know, going outside, but right now, you know, I've had a lot of fun doing it in San Diego and uh, I have a good partnership with Tyler Brown, you know, and um, there's no need really to do anything else. And, and, and I do get reached out to a lot from other tracks and even other countries, you know, obviously with social media. But I always tell them, 
yeah, I can tell you how I do it. But at the end of the day, everyone's always going to put their own little twitch on it and they can kind of do it themselves anyway, you know. So mm-hmm. always happy to to um, to advise or help anybody that wants to set some, something up like that in other states and other country. But uh, as of right now, I'm just happy to do it in San Diego. And uh, yeah, as it, as it continues to grow and uh, retention is good, then I'm happy where I'm at right now. Because you guys actually provide the bikes as well. So they don't even have to show up with anything. They just have to sign up for the camp and they're in. Yeah, and I think that's where I have a huge advantage. You know, I invested a little bit in my own money. I got a 22, you know, bought a Mercedes van, uh, a passenger van. And then I, you know, years later, I bought a, a 22 um, trailer, which we, um, and obviously with my partnership with Haro, um, I have a great relationship with them and, and, and fill it with bikes. So I think at some point, I mean, probably now, I've probably got about 80 bikes. And Whoa. then uh, 100% come in, um, as, uh, or they have been for the last, six, seven years now, I've been my sponsor. So they provide the helmets and gloves. Um, so I think, yeah, by the time the kids, all they'd need to do is show up with long sleeves and pants and we got the rest of the stuff ready to go, you know? So, um, so cool. yeah, it's a big investment, but I think it's uh, not everybody has a bike and the helmets. And especially now with the COVID, it's like I'm constantly, people are asking me for bikes and stuff. And uh, it's been good because obviously my sponsors, uh, we can direct a lot of the kids that buy this stuff to, uh, to, to sell stuff to them through the sponsors as well, you know? So it's been sure. really good. That's nice. Um, what's next for Dale Holmes? Well, actually, let me take this back. If someone wants to support that, if they're not going to you know, do it on their own somewhere else, but they want to support you in a way for sponsorship, you know, to be part of the camp, how do they get a hold of you for that? I think everything I do is I, I post a lot on my social media. My website is dalehomesracing.com. Uh, it's Dale Holmes Racing Facebook and then uh, Dale Holmes Racing Instagram. So you can reach me on there and, and see all the stuff that I do. Um, and yeah, obviously you can email and uh, message through all those uh, through all those outlets. Have you seen any of the campers at any of the races? Oh yeah, I see them all the time. Yeah, we've got right a lot of again a lot of my guys. I pass them on to Tyler. Uh, some kids are national races now. Some kids are doing good in expert nationally. Um, I see them every, you know, when I go to the track midweek, you know, I, uh, it's always cool to see kids or they'll recognize me and like, I did your camp or, uh, you know, I did your camp three years ago. And like, it's like, yeah, we've got a really great community now. I have a, a good database and, um, it's, it's always great to bump into them. But I think the last couple of years, and like I say, especially last year with the COVID and, um, you know, we sold an awful lot of bikes to these kids. Um, they're, they're out at the track regular weekend. I see them at the pump tracks and, Obviously, with the, my van, it's got all the logos on and stuff. So a lot of people recognize me um, just within San Diego alone, you know. So, it's, uh, yeah, it's cool to always bump into kids that have come from my camp and, 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 and continue to be in the sport, you know. What an awesome thing to come through. And you know the benefits and, and how much you loved racing BMX bikes and being a part of it. To be able to give that back and give that experience to somebody. Um, that's got to feel really good, man. That's really absolutely. Good. Yeah. It's, 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 if anything, when I'm leaving, you know, each camp, um, is a week long, five days. So fi- Friday is our final day. Uh, we have little fun races. We invite all the parents to come for the last couple hours on Friday to watch the kids race. And then we have a presentation giveaways, you know, we do photos, podiums and just make it a real fun last couple hours. Tyler comes in to talk to the parents about, you know, what he's doing as well. And, and really just kind of, Uh, educate everybody what it's all about but when I leave you know each day but when I definitely leave on a Friday it's rewarding I feel good um you know it's that race good race end of race weekend a good weekend of racing you know we'll all feel it when we've had those good weekends when we're flying home on a Sunday night and uh yeah a a, a sense of um you know you've done something cool but you've had fun at the same time and uh it's rewarding and that's why I continue to do it that's excellent. And you've also started a, a, a clothing company as well, amongst all the other things that you do. Yeah, just like, you know, what I started to do is um, I started, you know, like so many, when you're so in your lane for the last, you know, 30, 40 years of BMX, the last, you know, five, 10 years with social media and, and, and obviously um, media, I just started to look at other sports. I paid more attention to freestyle and I just started going down rabbit holes in skateboarding and, and seeing what these guys were doing and looking at like, wow, there's a lot of things we sh- should have been doing and sh- could be doing to, to add to racing, you know? And I just saw a lot of these skateboard guys, um, they've all got their own little clothing brands. And I know obviously they do, it, a lot of the freestyle guys do as well. And, and I don't even, we even call it freestyle anymore. So I just wanted yeah. a fun little thing to do. I, I hooked up with a friend in uh, England, Chico Hook, one of my friends put me in touch with a guy called Mark Ward. Um, and uh, he was a, you know, a uh, apparel guy, a graphic guy in England. And uh, 
he just kind of walked me through it. So we did a fun little brand. It's called uh, Divide, uh, Divide Brand, which is on uh, Instagram um, and Facebook. And uh, it's just like me really just learning to do something fun and new, you know. So, you know, T-shirts, hats and stuff and kind of back end a little bit with the guys I sponsor on the team. Um, and it's like fun, you know, obviously no one's going to make big money selling t-shirts and hats, but it's fun learning something new. Um, you know, and it's the same as a podcast, um, or anything. I'm not worried about stats or how many people listen and stuff. I don't even barely look at that stuff a couple of times a year. All I need to hear is a few guys. I'm sure you're the same Craig. It's like, Hey man, I enjoyed the show or I enjoyed the last podcast with Danny Nelson or that's all I need for, for anything, you know, for reward. And it's the same with divide, you know, it's not, it, there's no real plan. It's just to kind of do something fun. Everybody likes free stuff. I, I obviously use a lot of it, the camp stuff as well, to giveaways and stuff. Um, and so I have some clothes to wear for myself at the same time for me and my friends, you know, so it's all fun stuff. That's awesome. Yeah, I got a phone call from Tracer Finn this morning, as a matter of fact. Oh, Thank you. Keep it up, man. I was like blown away. Yeah, great guy. I love talking to you. Blown away. Yeah, yeah. Oh, such a good guy. Such a yeah, good guy. Absolutely. Um, well, Dale, man, thank you for your time. Keep doing what you're doing because it is making a difference without a doubt. Um, you know, the labor of love of, of things that we do pays off in the end one way or another. And it's in whatever you're doing, just keep rolling with it, man. It's fantastic. I appreciate it, Craig. Thank you very much. And keep doing what you're doing, Alex. I love the show. And uh, you are the best. I can't, we talk about it all the time. I always tell you, <laughs> You need to be the voice of BMX. You know, you need to be on TV again. And, and I cannot believe why BMX racing is not utilizing Craig Reynolds, you know, because yeah. you are, there's some great guys that do some cool stuff, but I still feel you're the best guy and you need to be, uh, you need to be you know, the forefront of our sport. And hopefully one day you will be. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Maybe, maybe one day. We'll see. Who knows? Well, if you guys like what you're seeing, please make sure you subscribe here on YouTube. And if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, subscribe there as well. Dale, have a fantastic day. It's always a pleasure chatting with you, and uh, I'll talk with you soon. Thanks, Craig. See ya.